everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to First Global's second STEM talk and interview session that's part of the programming for the 2020 First Global Challenge, Connecting Communities. My name is Sarah Fogel, and I'll be moderating today's talk. One important part of community is having the opportunity to learn with each other and from each other. We're hosting a variety of sessions throughout the season with interesting and inspiring individuals involved in STEM fields so we can discuss together, answer questions together, and learn together. Joining us today are two FIRST Global volunteers, Crystal Valentine and Nilesh Shaw, and they've been involved with FIRST Global since the beginning. Crystal has a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from MIT Manipal, as well as several other certifications. And not only has she volunteered at all three FIRST Global challenges, but she was also an instrumental in bringing on several Nordic teams in the inaugural year. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Uh, moving on to our second interviewee is Nilesh, who has a bachelor's in engineering from KJ Samaya College of Engineering, as well as training in business management. His involvement with First Global began as a mentor for Team India in 2017. And since then, he's volunteered at the past two First Global challenges and continued to grow First and First Global in India. Along with this, he's also a lead mentor for FRC Team 6024 R Factor. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for me having me here. Uh, it's, it's indeed a privilege and an honor to be at the part of the first global. So we're excited to have both Crystal and Nilesh with us here to discuss how engineering backgrounds have led them to volunteer and the impact that they've seen from their involvement with FIRST Global and how students can use their FIRST Global experience and an engineering degree to start an impactful life. We'll also be answering questions that teams from around the world have submitted. All right, so our first part of the interview, we're gonna be asking questions about you guys. So starting with maybe Crystal, can we talk a little bit about yourselves and what you guys do for a living? Absolutely. So I work as a product owner and a delivery manager at an industrial manufacturing company. Uh, so I work on the IT side. So I help uh, with building their applications and implementing um, uh, the, their business needs. And Nilesh, what do you do? I work, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, either, if you have more to say, go ahead. Um, no, I was just wanting to say that uh, previously I also worked in IT consultancy firm, so that had been a bulk of my background, and it's more recently that I, I shifted into the, uh, more in the driver's seat in the industrial company. Nice. And Nilesh, what about you? What do, what do you? what do you do for a living? Yeah. So uh, I'm the director of my family run business, uh, so I'm in fact an entrepreneur. And uh, we, we have a, you know, a spring manufacturing company that manufactures custom-made industrial springs used in a variety of applications. You know? So they could be elevators, they could be construction equipment, circuit breakers, uh, they could be valves, you know, all kinds of uh, different applications. And of course, I lead a team of uh, 73 uh, employees and uh, we do export uh, quite a bit uh, you know, to the US, uh, in fact, to Europe and quite a bit to Brazil. And of course, uh, all, I mean, uh, panning all across India, we have a lot of domestic sales too. Yeah, so that's my overall uh, as, a, as a career and uh, you know, that's what I do for a living. And we are a, quite an old, uh, uh, old company in the, in the sense that it's been 50 years uh, since we've been uh, in this business for a very long time. And yeah, I mean, absolutely enjoy uh, doing this role, you know, get to meet a lot of great, fantastic people and a lot of applications. So going off of that, that was a really good explanation of your job. Can you tell us what maybe a normal day at work looks like? I know everything's not normal right now, but what a normal day would look like for you? Uh, so uh, if you're talking for me, yeah, the normal work is, is like, uh, because I had the operations management team, uh, this means that on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I need to go to the shop floor. I need to look at, you know, what is the production going on? How are the machines functioning, you know, whether they're all okay or they need any kind of maintenance, any breakdown issues or any productivity issues. So I need to address them. Uh, besides that, what I, what I like really uh, the most about my work uh, is, you know, designing of these springs. So what I do is, uh, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the numerous types of applications uh, that we could have, I get an opportunity to study those applications and then, you know, design uh, and optimize uh, the springs for them. Some of them are very, very critical used in offshore applications, marine applications, in defense systems, and uh, quite a few of them have to be uh, fail-proof ones, you know? 
So this is what I normally do. And yes, on an average, I get around 25 to 30 phone calls from all kinds of customers, uh, you know, uh, looking for new business developments as well as, uh, you know, the existing customers. Yeah, but that's kind of uh, my day-to-day -day routine work. But it's, it sounds very interesting. It's not the same thing every day. You know, you got to fit it to whatever company that you're working with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You get a lot of a lot of different types of variety and a lot of different types of customers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Crystal, what about you? What's your day-to-day -day look like? Well, my day-to-day -day is uh, trying to understand the different needs from the business and seeing how we can implement them in the, in the IT landscape and balancing that with the needs uh, and issues that come up in the live environment. And... Uh, yeah, it's a lot of planning and replanning and trying to uh, fix issues as and when they come up, keeping the team motivated and on point on uh, what it is we need to deliver and uh, resolving any issues and just continuously improving the way we work. Yeah, sounds like playing it year by year each day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for both of you, what would you say is your favorite part of your job? Yeah, so uh, one of the favorite part of my job is, you know, designing the manufacturing systems, uh, implementing those systems, and also developing new programs, uh, you know, for our CNC machines. So what we try to do is, uh, you know, we try to optimize the processes, and we try to design the springs such that the highest amount of productivity would be available to us. At the same time, we try to pass on the benefits, uh, you know, of the higher productivity to our customer. So that kind of becomes quite a bit of a challenge because every time you deal with the spring, the all springs look almost the same, you know, but when you, when you really start going into the nuances and to the details, into the materials, metallurgy, heat treatment part, and there you go, you know, you can have a lot of different options uh, that really show up. And it is an amazing thing how dif these different parameters, uh, you know, can actually be worked around to give you the optimum results, you know? So that's, that's something which I really love doing. And uh, I think that's, that's my favorite part. And yes, I, I do strive more and more, try to delve into more of the spring technology and uh, keep learning uh, you know, with every single passing day. Yeah, so that, that really yeah. keeps me you, engaged. You sound like you like the challenges. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, I just love them, yeah. yeah, yeah. Crystal, what about you? Uh, for me, it's just trying to understand the different needs from the business and uh, getting to know what it is they do on a day-to-day -day basis and unpacking exactly uh, what are the difficulties they face? What are the desires they have? And just trying to reflect back on that and see what we can do in the application that I'm managing and try to bridge that gap between uh, what we have in the system today and uh, where it is we need to be. So it's the, it's the discovery process that's, uh, that I find quite fun. Yeah, so you both sound like you really like the challenges and the background of figuring it all out, getting it all together. Absolutely. So then along with that, um, if that's your favorite part. Uh, what would you say is a project that you worked on that you're most proud of? So one project that I, that's really close to my heart and which I really enjoy doing was uh, you know, quite a, initially in my career. And uh, you know, that's when uh, we had bought a, you know, a used machinery from Germany. And I wanted to convert that into a machine which could do a lot of automation and which could make really big, you know, very thick, uh, very heavy duty springs. So I set myself a goal that, you know, within about seven, six to seven months, I should be able to get this machine up and running. And uh, there it was like, uh, you know, I spent quite a bit of, quite a few days, uh, you know, trying to understand the entire mechanisms of the machines and trying to make sure that, uh, you know, my goal is achieved. Yes, it didn't happen in uh, six months, but it did happen over a year. And uh, it was immensely satisfying to see this entire machine with the whole control systems uh, being developed. And uh, to such an extent that today it is so easy to use this machine. Even someone with absolutely no skills whatsoever of using a CNC machine could just feed in a few of the dimensions and there the springs could be made ready. You know? So that has really given me an immense satisfaction and one of the best projects and my favorite, uh, in my all time favorite list, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure satisfaction and just a weight off your shoulders. Being Absolutely. able to figure it out. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's a lot of thrill and a lot of excitement to do that, yeah. Yeah. Crystal, what's a, what's a project that comes to mind for you? Um, I would say it's, the, it's a very recent project that I had started. Um, so I was in a workshop with some of the business users trying to understand, like I said before, what it is they do on a, on a regular basis, what kind of issues and difficulties they're, they're going through. And uh, part of that uh, workshop led me to, you know, discover that... Um, 
I, I think a, a lot of the times we put too much focus on just the technology side of the things. And sometimes it's better if we take a step back and try to focus in helping them get to what is the core work that they're trying to do. Uh, so I think, um, you know, that, that conversation led me into working on a project uh, to build a conversational AI solution uh, for the sales users in our company. So I think, um, you know, the whole, you know, the process of understanding what the problem is that they're, that they're experiencing and then trying to uh, figure out what solution we need to, to, to come up with to actually help them. Uh, so it's that entire process that I think uh, I enjoyed the most and converting that into a project and convincing the stakeholders to actually uh, fund this initiative and actually starting a proof of concept was, uh, was I think, what I'm proud of. I like it sort of taking the technology and putting it into words so they understand what they're doing and you can help the best that you can? Yeah, I think, um, I think it was more, you know, trying to focus on, on the end objective uh, of the business users rather than trying to say, oh, we have a lot of fascinating new cool technologies out there. How can we use it? We're kind of flipping it uh, the other way around and saying, okay, what is really the problem that they're, that they're experiencing and trying to focus on that and then fitting the solution really to that. So then if it happens that the solution was cool, then awesome, right? Then it works out. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that works out really well. But I think too often you get distracted with the cool technologies out there and you try to fit that yeah. to a problem and that usually doesn't go too well. Yeah. So I think for me, this, uh, this worked out really well and I'm quite, uh, quite happy that it started off in the right way and it's, uh, it's going ahead. So it's, uh, I like it, sounds nice. Uh, so moving on to our next question, for any students who might be interested in pursuing a career similar to yours, what advice or degrees would you recommend? So primarily studying any core engineering, like a mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or civil for that matter, is, is very, very important. Uh, because a lot of uh, the applied engineering streams are all, uh, you know, coming from these three or four core, uh, core streams. So it is very important that today, a uh, lot of application uh, engineering and a lot of applied sciences are being used. So for any of the students who want to pursue these, uh, these kind of uh, fields and these kind of degrees, it's very important to realize that it's not just the research part that is important. Yes, research is important, but that is more of the domain of the scientist. What an engineer needs to do is apply the knowledge uh, given and try to make uh, you know, a lot of innovations, try to come up with solutions that can be optimized and make sure that you know the innovations in general are for the greater impact and for the greater good of the society and the community as a whole and i think that's where uh, i just love this uh, first global you know because everything that you do is going to impact the community is is really impacting uh, you know the globe at a, uh, you know at a much larger scale so i think that's what uh, an engineering graduate should start thinking about and uh, anyone who chooses this field uh, must be must make sure that they are compassionate enough and uh, try to apply the technology that they learn, try to apply the engineering that they learn for the larger good of the community and the society. Yeah, that, that, would, be a, that would be a great thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I agree. It takes a certain type of passion and motivation to get through the entire engineering degree, as well as being able to apply it to the rest of your life. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Crystal, what would you suggest to students watching this? I think I would just kind of uh, build on Alicia's uh, response uh, and say that, I think it's it's good to also take uh, take some time to really evaluate why are you pursuing a STEM profession and see um, why are you really trying to pursue this? Where is your interest lie? What are you feeling passionate about? It's not always the you know the the specific domains that's important, but sometimes, as Nilesh said, the, the application side of it that's important. So quite often, if you reflect on this kind of um, this kind of a question, then you quite um, often will realize that it might not be one specific uh, degree or one specific um, educational track that might be relevant to your interest area. It might be a, a couple of them. Then it's easier to kind of uh, go backwards and say, okay, maybe this domain or this degree might uh, suit me better. If you are able to figure out where your passion lies and then work backwards from there and see that, okay, if, if how is it I want to spend my every day a couple of years from now? It doesn't have to be, you know, 10 years down the line. It could be for the next five years after you've finished uh, whatever degree it is that you're pursuing. How is it that you're going to uh, spend your time? What is it? What is the kind of work life that you're wanting to be doing on an everyday basis that uh, that's going to make you feel like, yeah, I want to wake up every day and do exactly this. Then this is going to bring me happiness and joy and, and keep me evolving uh, that competency area and evolving myself as a person. 
work backwards from that and see then what is the degree that you want to be pursuing. That's going to keep you um, going in the long term because um, you know, the STEM area is something that evolves over time. It's never something that's constant. So yes. I think for you to to keep that as one fixed um, you know mark in your life, it's um, it's something that uh, the passion is what's going to stay constant. So try to bridge that uh, passion with the degree that you're pursuing. That's gonna yeah, keep it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, the passion part is extremely important. And unless that really happens, uh, I don't think you know you can really move ahead. And it's it's. As you also rightly said, it, it changes and it evolves over the time. You know? So, so it's not necessarily that something that, that you like doing today, uh, you know, you might want to continue for a lifetime. You know? Things keep changing. In fact, I find that you know, even today or even after 20 years being into this field, you now you still have to learn a lot more, and you still feel like you know there's something more that can be done and that can be changed. You know, so I think yeah, that's that's one of the key things that uh, follow your passion. Yeah, that's very important. Yep. And I agree with both of you. I think you need to have the continuing uh, motivation because all of the STEM fields are all continuously changing. Now you need to have the motivation to keep learning, to stay up to date with you know articles, whatever uh, new coding that's coming out, new projects that are coming out um, and staying on top of it. Yep. Um, so from there, those are both very good answers. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna move on to some questions that teams have submitted to us. So the first question that we got was from Team Egypt. And the question is, if you were not working in your current fields, what would you be doing? <laughs> okay. uh, so, so probably, I mean, it's a little hard to imagine now after so many years, but yes, if, if probably if I was not managing our family business, I would have probably been a, a product designer, uh, maybe a, a system designer, or maybe even an architect. Uh, because, you know, I, I am a firm believer in the Einstein code, which says, Creativity is intelligence having a lot of fun. You know, so obviously anything to do with uh, the creative approach and anything where probably there's something that I could create on my own and with my own hands and I could see that creation happening. Yes, that would probably give me a lot of pleasure. So probably that would be my alternative career. Yes. I love that quote, Nilesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, for me, I think um, I would probably be either running my own NGO or either working for one. Uh, I, as a, you know, growing up, I did do a lot of volunteer work. Um, so I think that's probably that I would naturally uh, evolve into if it was not for this. Yeah, and I'm sure that question was kind of hard since we just discussed how passionate you both are about your fields. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next question is, was submitted from Team Granada. And they said, were there any role models that motivated you towards your career path? Yeah, in fact, in fact, many. Um, with each of the experiences, probably there, there were many role models who you look up to. But amongst all of them, there are two shining examples, uh, you know, whom I revere. And, uh, you know, probably their, their, uh, you know, their career stories have impacted uh, the most uh, in me. And uh, the first one being uh, Ratan Tata. He is the chairman of the uh, the Tata Group, you know, uh, Tata Sons. Uh, the next one is uh, you know, Narayana Murthy. Again, you know, he's the co-founder of Infosys. Both these are stalwarts in their own uh, domains, and the way they build their businesses, you know, these are on some some of the most important pillars. You know, so these include uh, these are the inclusivity, their skill building, their ethics. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, they believe a lot in wealth distribution. You know. So they are the shining examples of what volunteering for your nation building means. You know, so these two would, uh, you know, be my heroes and uh, definitely the best role models uh, that I could ever wish for. And you know, maybe make a little bit of an attempt to follow their foot footsteps. Yeah. Beautiful, Crystal. What about you? Well, for me, I think uh, it's it's been many to be honest. I think there have been many different personalities uh, and at, at different point in times that I looked up to, and it's been very specific traits that I that I admired. Um, but to be honest, over time, you know, I, I realized that while it's good to have role models, it's also important for you to re reflect back on yourself and see uh, how do you yourself evolve over time and uh, keep trying to see how you need to push yourself to grow. And try to keep that in focus because too often uh, when you look outwards at other people sometimes it gets a little intimidating um at, at least for me it became like okay so what 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 do, what should i do so i think uh, you know over time i matured to just uh, trying to see 
what do I need to do and how can I be the best me? Uh, but yes, I did have a lot of um, different traits from people that I actually admire. Uh, and that's the parts of them that I try to see in introspect and see how can I try and uh, bring that part of me out more. Yeah, and I like the way that you worded that. Don't try to be someone else, like your role models are a good model, but try to be the best you that you can bring into it. I thought that, that was really nice. Um, so the next question that we have is from Team Malaysia. And so their question is, can you tell us about a time when a project or an assignment didn't go as planned and how would you approach the assignment differently now? <laughs> I mean, uh, this happens all the times. Uh, I have yeah. not seen, I, I've, it's been a very rare instance that the projects actually go as planned. <laughs> it, uh, I've really not seen that happen too often. Um, maybe just a couple of times. Yes, yeah, so obviously uh, every time a project doesn't go as planned, it means that you have learned something. You really learned, uh, you know, probably why the project has not gone as per plan. Maybe your planning itself was at fault. You know, maybe the expectations itself were, were not correct. Maybe the objectives itself were not right. You know, it could be uh, multiple things and it could be a mix of all of those. But every single time a project doesn't go as planned, yes, an analysis does need to be done wherein you at least try to figure out what possibly things you could have done better or how you could have handled it in a little better way now. So this all happens in retrospective and a reflective uh, mode, not really... Um, you know, it, it really doesn't happen when, when you wish to do it, you know. And next time, whenever again the project comes, probably you will be repeating the same mistakes. It's not really easy to overcome them. Yes, but what can really be done is you have to build over the mistakes that have happened. Probably that goes like a knowledge builder, you know, and maybe that knowledge center can be used uh, effectively, uh, you know, next time whenever the same occasion or a similar project does arise. This could also mean that you could have a small team of uh, cross-functional skills uh, you know of which people have you could get them together and maybe they can give you a lot of insights which probably uh, the same team members are not able to give you you know probably there is a lot of unidirectional thought process that goes on in the team with a similar uh, kind of uh, skill set so it is very important to get hold of a few people who can think uh, you know from a different perspective and who are able to look at the problem from a, from a very uh, outside perspective and an outside point of view probably then each of these uh, you know, team members could add in a lot of value and maybe we could have uh, much better uh, you know, solutions over the challenges that we face in overcoming the, uh, the project. You know? so maybe that yep. could be one yep. of the ways. Yeah. 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 And bringing that full circle back to first goal. Well, I mean, these teams are working together to uh, figure out the problem. Yeah. To figure out the problem. And then they come to this big competition and they see everyone else's solution. They can talk to all these other other teams yes, and yes. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's perfect correlation, you know. Yep. Yeah. Chris, what about you? What's a project that didn't go as planned? Because I saw you smirking when I uh, initially <laughs> said that. <laughs> I mean, as Nilay said, this happens quite often, and you know, I think it's 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 unless you're running your own business, and then I have no perspective from that side. Uh, but yes, I think these are opportunities in disguise because you know you learn a lot from it. And as Nilesh said, sometimes it's, it's only in retrospective that you realize, okay, what went wrong? Um, but in the moment, a lot of this manifests as frustration and why is this not happening and what can be done better? And why is this not, why are we not able to proceed and or what's going wrong? Uh, but at least in, in the IT sphere, we, we do try to run regular retrospective sessions where, you know, irrespective of how the project actually got completed or, you know, how your sprints, um, uh, you know, got completed, you do have retrospective sessions where you re reflect back on what went well and also what went wrong and what you, what aspects of what you did uh, worked well, what would you like to continue to do and what would you like to change and what didn't go well and what you should stop. So I think irrespective of how a project uh, ends, uh, concludes, it's, it's always a good practice to, to run a retrospective session. Yes. And I think also having, you know, uh, regular touch points every day to just uh, touch base with everybody is, is also an important practice to make sure that um, you're, you know, taking a sense of the, of how the team feels. And, uh, you know, so you're, you're kind of having checkpoints on a regular basis to see if there's some pivots that you need to make. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's, it's, it's very important that um, you have diverse people involved uh, in your stakeholder yeah. community who you are uh, syncing with on a regular basis to understand if you have really understood the problem. Because 
a lot of the times it's um, if you've not really understood the problem, then forget about everything else. Yeah. You think you're coming up with a cool solution, but that's not really what they wanted in the yeah. first place. Yeah. So I think, uh, as Nilesh said, the, the more diverse people you, you bring into scope, uh, the better your solutions will be. And to not uh, you know, get intimidated that there are so many people that you're bringing into the fold and it's gonna be complicated to manage that. If you have a lot of design thinking principles that you can use and frameworks and methodologies you can use to manage that. But the more people you involve, uh, the more voices you bring into the fold, I think the better um, you're gonna conclude. So yeah. I think these are some, there's always uh, you know, a learning opportunity as uh, when things fail, but um, usually these are the common, Culprits. Yep, I agree 100 percent. And with the learning opportunity, since we're in our wonderful pandemic right now, everyone's needing to learn different things to communicate, to work from home. So a question from Team Chile was that, do you think the pandemic has positively affected the worldview in one of these STEM areas? Um, yeah, well, an immediate thing is like how what we are doing today, what we are doing right now, you know, the technology in fact has probably brought us a little closer, uh, even without, uh, you know, physically meeting each other, you know. So I think one of the key things that has probably uh, been seen as a positive impact uh, of this entire pandemic is that irrespective of which part of the world you are, irrespective of the geographical boundaries, the barriers, you know, the communication has certainly improved to a large extent. Suddenly you find that, you know, everywhere uh, these kind of video conferencing platforms are being used. And also you find that the infrastructure being required for these kind of uh, platforms is being laid out and this opportunity is being uh, made use of. So yes, certainly that is one of the positive takeaways you know, uh, from the pandemic. Uh, there could also be uh, another thing, which is that there is a great awareness about, you know, uh, about how we can make our world more sustainable. Uh, there is a lot, uh, a lot of awareness about uh, what needs to be done with our healthcare systems. There is also a lot of awareness now about what could what could we do probably to improve our environment. So yes, overall, uh, you know, this pandemic has has brought in a greater awareness in terms of uh, trying to find out uh, sustainable solutions for whatever we had been doing uh, prior to the pandemic. You know, and how we could really make our world a little better place and uh, make sure that. Uh, along with uh, you know the newer comforts, the newer technologies that we are using, we still try to make uh, you know more and more sustainability as a part of our designing the systems and as a part of our day-to-day -day routine lives. I think that's that's probably one of the key takeaways that I find, uh, which has come from this pandemic. Yep, I agree. Crystal, what positive uh, positive effects have you seen from this pandemic? Um, I think. Um... This pandemic has definitely, you know, made it evident that, you know, there's a lot of need for STEM professionals uh, without a question. I think it's emphasized it much more. Uh, and of course, in very different uh, STEM professions that there is a need for it. Um, having said that, I think it's, it's also emphasized the, uh, the gaps that we see between the non-STEM professions and the STEM professions that, you know, while we there is a need for STEM professions, there's also an important area where we need to focus on bridging the gap between the non-STEM profession areas and the STEM professionals. Because a lot of the time, and going back to also the previous question, that a lot of the times it's not just about the, the cool solutions that you come up with, but if you have not understood the context in which you are uh, needing to apply that, you're kind of, uh, you're missing the point. Or, you know, if the, the people who are going to be applying these solutions, if they don't understand it or if they don't appreciate it, then you're kind of missing the train again. So I think there is a lot of importance also that this pandemic has, uh, you know, made evident that there are a lot of gaps in the non-STEM professions also that we need to, to plug in uh, or you, we need to plug those. Uh, so there is also a lot of focus that uh, that needs to go in that area as well as uh, you know kind of continuously building the the need uh, for the stem professions as well i'm not sure i've articulated that well as it sounded in my head but no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah that 100 percent made sense to me and i'm sure to everyone else that's going to be watching this um and something that uh, i used to be on a robotics team something that we used to talk about is that whatever we build it has to be a viable solution. Whereas, yeah, it could be electronically and mechanically sound, but if it looks like a pile of wires, you know, no one's going to want to buy that or look at it. Whereas you need to bring in those creative people who understand it and can make 
make it look pretty and sort of work together uh, to make a solution that everyone's gonna want to buy or want to see. Absolutely, and I, and I think also things like policies and regulations around um, that needs to go hand in hand with some of these solutions are also quite important. Because I think if you have some of, um, if those are the weak links, then it doesn't matter what great solutions you've come up with, it's still going to fail. You're not gonna be able to translate that into, in, into you know, mass usage. Um, yeah, so it is important to, to bridge uh, the entire chain of, uh, yeah. I agree. <laughs> uh, so our next question is coming in from Team Nigeria. So their question was, what challenges did you face in implementing STEM programs in schools and how did you overcome that? <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, integrating STEM programs uh, in schools uh, into the curriculum itself is, is you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very big challenge because uh, none of the schools or not even the entire administration, uh, you know, uh, kind of looks at STEM programs as a part of a, of a regular academic curriculum. They are in fact treated as an extracurricular activity or uh, most of them are treated as you know something which you do as a hobby. It's not really uh, integrated into your regular curriculum into the way you study any of these things. So I think that's one of the key uh, you know key challenges that we face at least in India you know wherein uh, it's very very difficult to make a school accept uh, you know that STEM programs are very very important and that they should integrate it into their regular curriculum. So that's one of the one of the major issues that we face. The other thing is to set up any STEM lab in a country like in a developing country like India, it's very, very difficult because you need a lot of funding. And unfortunately, we do not have so many of the uh, schools which could afford those kind of, uh, you know, uh, those, those kind of, they do not have in fact those kind of funds to set up uh, the STEM labs. So what we are doing is my FRC team 6024, uh, you know, we have come up with our mission, which says uh, promote, connect, and integrate. So what we do is we promote uh, the STEM programs amongst a lot of school children, amongst the entire student community in various cities and towns. What we then do is connect these students or these communities uh, to the corporate and the industrial world. We ask these industries and the corporates to provide some funds to support these students so that they could engage in some kind of STEM programs. And after that, once that happens, then we try to integrate the schools by asking them to adopt these communities, these student communities, and also take help of these corporates so that they could actually build a, a, a system which is more sustainable in their schools. Of course, the success rate has been pretty much uh, low, uh, but yes, we have a vision of you know, making first without boundaries, wherein uh, we try and make a very, very sustainable first ecosystem uh, come up in every school. So yes, attempts are being made and we are in fact collaborating with a lot of first teams across India uh, to help us to help spread this message uh, you know, of uh, creating a sustainable ecosystem. Hopefully in the next few years, we should be able to see uh, much better penetration into the schools and a lot of schools adopting uh, STEM programs as a part of their regular curriculum. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that would be our endeavor. Yeah. It sounds difficult, but it sounds like you have it under control and you have a plan for it. So we appreciate everything that you guys are doing for Frost Global there. So Crystal, what about you? Um, I think uh, my experience had been mostly in the, in the beginning when um, you know, trying to get the Nordic teams uh, to join in uh, First Global in 2017. Uh, there, I think it was pretty much like what you explained, uh, Nilesh, that it's, it's a lot of uh, difficulties with uh, when it comes to funding and then to see this, that it's, um, it, it shouldn't be seen as something just as an extracurricular. It's something that you need to build into what you're doing on a, you know, what the students are learning on an everyday basis. And it's quite important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much, uh, you know, blending it into the regular curriculum and yes. funding. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a little difficult to understand why, why doesn't, uh, you know, the, the academicians or why doesn't the, why don't the authorities actually build it up into a kind of a system wherein, you know, you ought to learn. I mean, it's a project-based learning, you know, and you just have to take it a little step ahead and make sure that, you are integrating all the sciences together so that you know you could you could apply them together you i mean how do you apply a discrete mathematics discrete uh, science discrete engineering into the real world it doesn't happen i mean you have to you have to apply everything together so we can't uh, we can't afford to lose time by you know um, you know uh, involving our kids and the other youth uh, you know to let their graduation get over and then try and tell them now you apply everything together it's too late it's very late yeah. you, you have to begin a little early 
and that has to be a part of their growing up process rather than uh, you know doing it all at the you know end, tag end of their academic career. Yeah. I, I yeah. think it's it's a, it's honestly an you know they they underestimate the power of uh, you know of doing it in this way as a project based learning because it 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 brings a lot of fun into STEM. And unless you see that this thing, you know, this area is something that can be fun, there's no way you can actually build a passion in this area. They, they need to create opportunities for them to see how you can apply these skills and how it can be fun. Yeah. So we've seen students, you know, who it's probably... Just, uh, academic. Yeah. And so, so a lot of students who probably, you know, were not really comfortable with either math or science, but when they start doing these hands-on uh, hands programs, you know, they then realize that, you know, so many things have already applied. Like say, for example, if there was something like a projectile motion, they are already doing it with the help of a shooter. They've never realized that something like this can happen. And after that, if you tell them the theory behind the entire projectile motion, they're probably able to appreciate it much better. And it's much easier for them to grasp the entire concept and it stays with them for life. I think that's, that's one of the simplest ways to teach concepts. And I think the big distinction between how typically schools are, are teaching students versus when, when you work on projects like this is, you know, in the, in the typical way of learning is what you don't know becomes your weakness over there because the focus is about scoring and, you know, being yes. top of your class and, you know, the rank versus when you're doing it in, in the project way of, uh, of learning things, what you don't know is actually your, your strength because that yes. becomes yes. your motivation to reach from point A to point B and, and conclude with the best solution. That is your strength. That's not your weakness mm -hmm. there. Exactly. So I think it's a very different mindset. And one is your, you know, one is something that really is going to take you forward in the future, whereas the other one is not really preparing you in a, you know, in a well-rounded yes. way. Yes, yes. And certainly, I mean, it's like learning to fail. You know, so the yes. earlier, the faster you learn to fail, the better you become. You know, so I think exactly. that's that's something which is very, very important and which uh, most of our uh, students, you know, in today's generation, as well as schools need to adopt this. They really need to understand that, uh, you know, learning to fail is, is perfectly fine. And that's how you will learn a lot of things. I think it's important. Exactly. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. So I think something that the three of us can agree on is that starting some education at a younger age in schools as their students, as they're growing up, uh, is probably the most important and the most impactful. So carrying on through that, uh, we have a question from Team Angola, which is given the gender gap in the STEM fields, what can we do to motivate more females and girls to, to pursue STEM careers? Okay, yeah. So that's, that's another, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the most burning issues probably uh, we face in our country. It's, 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 been, it's been there for, for uh, I don't know how many years, you know, I can't even imagine. Uh, you know, how this has been allowed to go unnoticed or how we allow this to keep happening even today. Now, under the uh, vision of our FRC team, what we are saying is uh, we will encourage a lot of girls to take up uh, the STEM education. We are saying that uh, our vision is to have first without boundaries and that includes the gender disparity. That also includes, you know, the bridging the gender gap. So what we are trying to do is uh, we help a lot of girls, encourage them to take up uh, skills which are traditionally taken up by, by boys, like say CADing. So we help them, we, we teach them SOLIDWORKS, we teach them CREO, we teach them any kind of computer-aided designs. We also help them with the mechanical construction. So whether it is lifting your power tool and you know, drilling a few holes or uh, cutting with a saw or you know, making your own, uh, uh, making your own uh, kind of tools and devices, these are all skills that need to be learned by even girls, by everyone, in fact. You know, it's, it's a very, very important skill that they need to know because unless you do it, you will really not figure out, uh, you know, how it works. So that th those are some of the important skills uh, that we try and build it uh, into our own uh, team as well as spread it across to the other teams. Also, what we have done is like, for example, last year, we had an all-girls uh, team, uh, you know, representing uh, Team India, uh, you know, for the first global. So all the five girls uh, were a part of our, uh, you know, our uh, FRC team. And uh, in fact, we were very happy that uh, they took up this entire challenge on their own and they learned a lot of skills on their own. In fact, uh, they became so attached uh, to the entire STEM learning that they have continued doing this and uh, something which is very close to their heart. You know, so I think that's, that's one of the important steps uh, that, that we try and take. Uh, also last year, we had uh, one, uh, again, an all girls uh, team from a very, very, uh, you know, uh, kind of an economically backward uh, area uh, in, in India. And these girls uh, showed their mettle 
and in fact they proved a point by winning the first lego league at the national level and in fact they represented uh, the country at the uh, first cha world championship in detroit you know? so that's something which is phenomenal you know if we have uh, if you have such shining examples we also have uh, two girls in our team who are the uh, dean's list winners and in fact one of them has gone on to win the dean's list uh, at the world championship uh, you know so so th these these are some of the most uh, shining examples uh, and i think uh, you know they are really helping us uh, break the gender stereotypes and also you know they they have they have now become like uh, trailblazers and uh, excellent ambassadors of stem programs in india a lot of other girls would look up to them and we hope uh, that we'll be able to you know kind of uh, if not completely close the gap at least narrow it down uh, to more manageable levels exactly and it's the domino effect where you know these girls you said they're winning deans list winners um around the world so girls are looking up to them then those next girls will look up to them and yeah i love it crystal what about you this is a very interesting question and um i think uh, one thing which caught my attention was uh was i don't see this that it's necessarily a problem of motivating girls into into stem fields I think this is a very systemic issue that that um, that we need to remember also that you know what the way we see this as a problem in one geography might not be the same you know reasons for why it's a problem in another geography. So we need to see the the systemic contributing factors as to why do we have this gender gap, for example, in India, and what are the reasons why we have a gender gap uh, in STEM fields in in Angola. And the way you you address this and how you look at this problem systemically. And the solutions that you might come up with over there will be drastically different than what you would need to to come up with, for example, in mm -hmm. India or in Angola. So I think it's quite important uh, to understand all of the contributing factors, all the different actors that's involved in a positive and in a negative way, and see how you can influence the the ecosystem around it as well. Because you know, we might think that it's it's enough to have you know certain programs that's you know helping you know girls come in. But if there are other systemic reasons that's preventing them from even participating, then it's not enough. And what might be a reason uh, over here in, in one place might not be the same thing, for example, in Sweden. Here we might have different reasons. Maybe it's actually a motivation factor, for example. But that might not be the case for, for example, in Angola. There you might have girls who are really motivated to participate in STEM fields, but there's other barriers that they're not able to, to cross. So it's very important that when we're trying to address the gender gap and for, for example, any barriers uh, or any other uh, discriminatory reasons for, for people participating in STEM fields, you really look at it from a holistic perspective and see why are you having these gaps in this place or in, in, which, in which country you're talking about and start seeing yeah. how you can you know, plug all of that first. So it, it is important to have uh, access to a lot of good programs and have other girls and other uh, role models for, for other students to, that will come after them. But it's also important to see what are the, you know, the holistic reasons uh, that's contributed to this problem in the first place. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's, uh, that's very important. It's, it's, as you rightly said, it's a systemic problem. And it is certainly geography specific. For example, even within India, uh, probably a metro city and a town and a village will have their own set of problems. Absolutely. You know? So, so it's 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 not that uh, it's not like one size fits all, and you know you could have a common solution for everything. No, it's certainly it's not that. Uh, there there will be very very specific solutions, and and certainly uh, whatever effort, how much ever effort you put at the at the current stage, will not be enough. We've probably just begun, you know, and we have not even uh, you know touched uh, maybe even one percent of the entire uh, you know population that we're really talking about. So it's, it's it's still a, a long, long way to go, and a lot of effort uh, that a concentrated effort really needs to go into this uh, this direction. You know, otherwise, it's it's still we are long away. We are, we are, we have a long way to go. Yeah. But 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 one thing is uh, something that was uh, also important to to notice over here that most of the the youth they don't see the world the same way that uh, the older generation sees it. We see all these discrimination that has come in, but. For them, it is something that's learned. They are not born realizing that, oh, there is all of this discrimination there. It's something that they observe our generation doing. Yes. So that's important yes. for us to realize that, you know, this is a learned behavior. So you, 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 we need to stop those reasons as well. Um, 
sometimes it's good to for us to get out of the way of the youth because a lot of the time it's our generation that's coming in in the way <laughs> yes yes absolutely absolutely i think that's that's uh, that's uh, that's the key in fact they don't view it the way we view it you know and as 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 the generations grow you know every five years you see a newer generation coming up and you know they have a very very different perspective and yes we should let them be as it is and we should let them allow them to uh, you know to kind of uh, not blind them with our thought processes and with our conditioning you know so Absolutely. maybe that the onus of doing that lies um, entirely on our generation and on us certainly yeah agreed those are both really good answers and now i don't even want to pull us away from this topic but we're, <laughs> the next question is way in a different direction <laughs> uh this next question was submitted by team algeria and they want to know being an engineer or a working professional is absolutely time consuming it requires a lot of work and effort as you guys know uh how do you manage to integrate volunteering into your life how do you find time for it um yeah so managing the family business has, has certainly uh, needs a lot of hard work a lot of effort and probably there are no uh, kind of time limits uh, you know you could probably get a call at any time and you know your work hours could could consume uh, very very long hours yes that certainly happens but when my son adiv uh, and his team started doing the first lego league uh, it kind of intrigued me and i was very curious to know what kind of programs are these uh, first programs that he's trying to do and uh, probably that's how i got a little involved and i don't know when that little became a little more and when that little more became even a little more and then it kept increasing and uh, it it kind of became you know like a like a you know a a, a very very uh, difficult habit to let go of you know so you 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 just keep clinging on to it and you keep uh, just trying to understand you know what more could be done and his transition from uh, you know being a first lego league participant uh, to doing all kinds of first tech challenge and then the first global championships and all of that along with that probably i also grew very close uh, to to the first programs and i saw a lot of merit in which uh, he had evolved the teams had evolved the entire bunch of kids around us how they have all evolved you know from being a little uh, shy and a little introvert uh, you know kind of kids uh, you know they, they these these programs could kind of transform them into a, a different person altogether and give them a much better global perspective you know which we all uh, yearn to see so that was a kind of impact that really motivated me to to make sure that i keep uh, you know in myself engaged with these programs and then uh the transition became so seamless that you know moving on from just being a parent to a coach and then i became a judge at the local events and then it became a no a national the organizers at the national levels and then an international judge and then mentoring the frc teams so in fact it has now come to a level wherein uh, at least one or two days of my week are reserved for volunteering uh, you know for first you know so this become kind of a very very integral part uh, you know of of my uh, day to day life and uh, i still remember you know there is a very common uh, saying in first it's like you know first is like a mafia and there is only one way <laughs> that is in you know so i i, I think exactly what is uh, what has happened and uh, you know it's 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 kind of very very addictive and engaging yes but i really love uh, the volunteering bit and it is in fact uh, gives gives me a lot of satisfaction it also is uh, kind of a stress buster you know so it's been really really great uh, you know engaging and playing out all those roles i mean it's just been fantastic yeah i agree and i think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier where you guys were talking about how passionate and motivated you are in your uh fields of study or fields of work um it goes back to that where if you want to make time for first if you want to make time for volunteering and mentoring you will make the time to do it because you know the impact that it makes yeah certainly I think this is a very interesting question uh to, to get from uh from the students. Uh <laughs> to be honest this is something that uh, after I came and participated in all the in, in the in these um first global competitions it's something I learned by observing the students and I figured out that hey wait these guys have crammed up so much in their day and they have a smile at the end of it and they're so positive so enthusiastic surely i should be able to learn something from that right so it's interesting getting the question back i'm like dude i i learned this from you guys how to manage my time and you know balance being a mom being a wife taking care of home being you know managing work and volunteering i learned it from you all how to manage my time well because you guys have inspired me that it is possible 
So it's interesting getting this question. Um, but I must add that, you know, it, it also goes back to what you feel passionate about. If you feel passionate about something, you will make it a priority for you. And if you're able to manage to blend your work life and your personal life in a seamless way, it makes it much more easier. Um, also, I think after I became a mom, um, I, I kind of took this a little bit more seriously because being a woman, a woman in STEM, I took it much more important that, you know, I do want my, I have two boys. Um, so I take it much more seriously that I want my sons to look at me and remember that my mom did this. So I want to see other women around them as they're going to also have the same opportunities and also be taking that seriously as well and see that everyone should have the same opportunities. I, I kind of take that a little more seriously as well. So it's one thing to do it in your work life, but also personally, because, um, when you're volunteering, it's something that you're choosing because you feel passionate about it. So as they see you doing this, um, uh, they watch and learn. So if they see you doing this in your personal time, they, they, will, they will learn to, you know, do the same. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 Learn by doing. yeah. <laughs> um, and so as we were talking about different competitions, how you guys are volunteering, spending your time mentoring, a uh, question from Team Omen was that, what have you guys learned from being a judge at First Global? You were talking about watching the teams, but what else have you guys learned from uh, interacting? Oh, I mean, every First Global has been uh, such an enriching and amazing experience. Uh, you know, some of the things that we really learn, I mean, at least I've learned from First Global is humility, compassion, and uh, of course, enthusiasm. You know, so humility is like, uh, you, you just have to interact with any of the teams, uh, you know, which come from across the globe. And it is just amazing to see the kind of challenges that they had to endure just to form the team, the challenges that they had to endure to even, you know, just get a, a kit of parts, you know, which is with them. And the kind of, uh, you know, challenges that they, that they really uh, have to undergo just to make sure that they reach, uh, you know, the venue. I mean, it is simply amazing, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, difficulties that the teams face probably you know we have we have taken so many things for granted and when you look at that and when you start comparing oh my god i mean it's like it's it's, it's just too it's just too humbling an experience as to how important it is for the teams just to come here just to come to first global you know and that really really uh, you know makes you feel like you know you you are indeed privileged and uh, you know there is a lot of uh, humility that we need to actually uh, you know build into our own uh, system uh, to kind of, uh, you know, appreciate uh, these kind of difficulties. The other thing is compassion. So, I mean, uh, I, I was there at, uh, at, at Washington and there you see uh, First Global with its, you know, small set of uh, volunteers and they are all over the place. They are trying to manage everything and yet with a very big smile on the face and yet, you know, uh, making sure that everybody is comfortable, though there is a little bit of chaos happening here and there. But still, in spite of all of that, what is important is that they have the all the volunteers at, at First Global have really taught us, uh, you know, the true uh, meaning of compassion. You know, so they they try to they try to be so compassionate. They have they have made such a great attempt. Probably I know for sure that they would not have slept for nights together. You know, in spite of all of those things, if they are still you know uh, managed to putting on that great smile on the face and yet make sure that uh, you know that uh, the compassion brims over. Uh, you know, in every act that they do, it is it is a phenomenal feeling, and you know that just rubs on to you, and probably you try to take in a little bit of whatever you learn from them, and of course, then you see the enthusiasm, uh, teams coming over from you know all corners of the world, having endured all kinds of probably three flight changes or so, and you know, and probably the first journey that they undertake, uh, you know, in a in a flight, and there they come in there, you know, they they are all very very happy just to be there. And brimming with that enthusiasm, what more? But you know that kind of becomes so infectious. Uh, you know, probably I carry back that enthusiasm with me, and it lasts me for at least a year till the time I get back to First Global. I think that's something really, really phenomenal. You don't see that kind of energy in many other programs. It's it's just phenomenal. Yep, I agree a hundred percent with that. Yeah, the passion stays with you, and then as soon as it's over, you're sort of still riding that, and you're like, okay, when's the next competition? What are we doing next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there, there is a lot to learn from the students. And 
you know, there are a couple of things that really that that I learned from, and uh, every time that I came and participated in this uh, in this competition, and you know, it, there were some uh, you know teams where I remember that they had lost their um, their their kit was lost in transit, and they were sitting cool as cucumbers and like, yeah, where's your kit? Where's your robot? It's like, yeah, it's lost in trans in transit. Um, so what are you gonna do? Yeah, we 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 plan to get the parts from the you know the 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 workshop and some of the other students are going to get it and we're going to build it. Do you have your manual how to build it? No, we, we just remember it. So it, it's, you know, observing all of these things that, you know, I was able to take back into my work life. I'm like, you know, if these students, if they have come all the way across the world, they have lost it and they're still able to keep a smile on their face, stay calm, stay professional, and they're able to see it through. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely, then you yeah. Have, you know, some students who the amount of confidence with which they're able to speak and convey their thoughts and, you know, the, the way they're able to articulate the things that they've learned and also the way they've translated everything that they have learned into, you know, in actually something that they can, you know, show. That's also something that that's quite commendable. So it's, it's all of these things. Sure, I'm coming there as a judge, but there's a lot that I'm learning from the students and I'm able to take back into my work life and implement it in, in what I'm doing on an everyday basis. So it's, um, yeah, it, I guess maybe I should change my answer to the question when you said role models. I guess, you know, I do have a lot of role models that I <laughs> have. So, you know, we have a lot, it's easy to look, you know, look out there and say, yeah, you know, this, this person from that company is doing such an awesome job, but you know, they have a lot of, you know, they've had a lot of conditioning to get there, but these guys, these are the real role models. They have, they have come through a lot. They have, you know, they have been put, you know, it, on the spot in a lot of the times when we were speaking to them and they have they have delivered them they have done such an amazing job agreed and at, <laughs> and at such a young age as well yeah exactly yeah. The, the, it's it, um that's that was what was uh, amazing for me coming every year absolutely yeah and i yeah. missed that this they're year true role models they're true role models i'm, I'm sure i agree with that completely yeah so then moving on to another team that we've heard a lot about throughout the competitions, uh, Team Honduras. Uh, how would you describe First Global in a single word? Because I've heard a lot of words being thrown around. I'd love to see what you guys say. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so difficult even to describe first as an experience. So I don't know how do we really put that into one word. No, it's, 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 it's a very, very tough one. But yes, if it had to be a word, it's, it's probably inclusivity. I mean, that's, that's what I would say, maybe an opportunity or impact. For me, oh yeah, like you said, Nilesh, we can come up with so many words to describe <laughs> this. Yeah. But if I was to pick one, I would say empowerment. Um, that, that's the word I would describe. That's yeah. what the students get from this, uh, from First Global. Yeah. I think those are both, as, uh, as you said, it's hard to cap it into one word, but I Very think those, yeah. those are both yeah. pretty good choices. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to explain to someone what exactly do you do in first or first global. I mean, it's, it's so Robots. difficult to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and even that is not enough because it's, it's so much more than just the robots, you know? Yep. So it's, yes. it's, yeah, it becomes very difficult to explain. It's, it's just an experience that, that someone needs to have. Yep, I agree. So this will be our last question. This is from Team Estonia. So has being a first global volunteer impacted your work in any way? I know it's a really hard question. <laughs> um, yeah, so first global has certainly uh, helped uh, me broaden my vision. Uh, it has made it uh, a little easier for me to accept challenges. You know, as we said that, you know, the team had lost its robot on the way in transition and yet they were absolutely cool. So yes, uh, you know, it has made me realize that things can go wrong in work, things can go wrong in your business, but you still have to hold your foot and you can still, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that you win uh, the battle, though it may be a long one to endure. Yes, so that is something uh, which certainly helps, uh, uh, you know, which has taught uh, me from First Global. It has also helped me understand different perspectives, you know. So maybe it's not just one perspective, but multiple perspectives. And it's not necessary that only a one particular uh, you know, point of view or a perspective could be right. You could have a conglomeration of many different perspectives and yet all of them could be correct. And maybe you just need to review the different kinds of situations. So it has certainly helped, uh, you know, uh, in fact, help me grow uh, in, in all of these aspects. 
and also it has helped me in some kind of a pursuit for excellence you know like like how uh, wins lombardi in fact uh, he, he quotes uh, that you know we will chase perfection very well knowing that uh, it is it is just impossible uh, to achieve perfection but yes on the way uh, we will catch excellence and that is you know something which probably uh, you know we've seen a lot of teams at first global do they have put in their best they have strived to give in their best and on the way yes they have uh, made something which is worth calling excellent you know so i think that's that's a key takeaway which i've learned from uh, first global yeah yeah that was a very good answer <laughs> Um, for me, I think there was another uh, learning from uh, First Global by, by observing again the, the students that participate here is that uh, there were a few teams that, um, that were not able to receive their kits for whatever reason. And they had to work with, uh, with teams from other geographies to where they would build the, the robot based on the instructions that this team would give. So I think this uh, remote collaboration also is something that, you know, that I was quite, uh, you know, quite uh, amazed when, when I was interviewing the students to, to learn from that, that uh, quite often we, we, especially in the profession that the, the area that I work in, that it's, it's always uh, good to have the team who are co-located co with you and it's easier. But I think, um, you know, this experience also, I learned that it's, it's not always that you have to be co-located. It is definitely possible for you to work uh, remotely. And it doesn't, it's, it's not a barrier that, you know, what you're working on is complex, it's still possible. You are able to work uh, across uh, complexities, you are able to work across language barriers, cultural barriers, and you're still able to get the work done and do a really good job at it. So yeah, that's uh, some, of the, some of the things that you, when you observe the students, the way they have been able to overcome some of the issues that, uh, that you would think are issues, you know, you're able to put that into practice, practice in your own workplace and say that, okay, you know, you, you say that you, it's easier to co, Co be, to be co-located and be able to work easier. That's not always a barrier. If you have better competencies in different geographies, go for it. Uh, if you have, if you think uh, culture is going to be a barrier, mm, not really. We have seen that being a non-issue over here. You come from completely different backgrounds and the teams are able to thrive and really do a good job. So it, it's, um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's a lot of learnings for me, especially Every time I come, I, I always see that there's something new that I've learned from the students and be able to take it back into my work life. So yeah, for sure. I still remember in 2017, we had this uh, you know, team from, uh, uh, I think somewhere in the Middle East, I think one of the countries, I don't remember which one, but you know, so they had come uh, with a, only the kit and nothing was actually, uh, actually made. The robot was not actually made. And, uh, you know, suddenly you see that, you know, our team guys, you know, also helping them out completely. There is a language barrier. They don't understand. They don't, I mean, uh, it's it just very, very difficult to communicate. I mean, there was no language, uh, you know, probably they couldn't understand English and our guys couldn't understand their language. And, and still at the end of the third day, the robot did, uh, you know, happen and it was able to compete in one of the uh, competitions, you know, so it was like amazing to see this, how none of the barriers can actually, which we see as a barrier, are not really there. You know, they, they don't they don't just uh, they don't just exist, and they're still able to do you know all of this. It's something which is really really phenomenal. You know, so this this is something yes, uh, great great takeaway from First Global. You know, none of these can actually become barriers. It is only your drive and your passion and your enthusiasm to do things that uh, that take you further. Yep, and I, I agree with that, whereas teams are coming to these competitions. I remember specifically in 2017, teams would show up with little to nothing and other teams would show up with yeah. full functioning robots. And, you know, yeah. these teams, these students will give anything they can, whether it be knowledge or parts or coding help, just to make sure everyone's got a running robot, everyone can help out, everyone can compete together. So I, yes, I really appreciate everything that we've been learning from First Global. Uh, from any volunteer, everyone sees different parts of it, all the teams interacting. I just think it's great. Um, so with that, we conclude today's STEM talk and interview. So I thank you both for taking time to talk with us. And I'm sure all the students are gonna love your answers. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure being a part of First Global and meeting all the different students. I've loved it and I miss it this year. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and with that, to our viewers, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.